uh, welcome to the local co-op development um, fringe session. Um, it's been a really positive uh, conference so far today. It was great to hear Jonathan Reynolds speak about community wealth building and acknowledge the role local government has in, in co-op development. Um, it's been really positive to hear how the uh, co-ops unleashed from the grassroots um, policy lab work has developed um, and to hear from Anna and the team in Plymouth on that. Um, and that's that started to explore some of the practical action. I think this session um, is coming from, from three of us at Co-ops of UK. We'll do introductions in a minute. Um, and this is to, to really uh, give an overview of where we some of the, see some of the opportunities for local government to engage with some of the existing programs and infrastructure that is available um, around co-op development. But before we, I introduce my colleagues, I would just like to give a quick overview of where we, we are now. So I think there's an acknowledgement within the network that co-op models are, are a good fit for today's economy. Um, they're collaborative, innovative, they're rooted in our, uh, in our communities. But we need to acknowledge that uh, cooperatives are oh, a very small part of our economy. They're only 0.1% of, of our business base. Um, and while they've experienced some steady growth over recent times, there's certainly nothing spectacular um, and certainly nothing uh, that would suggest that we are doing enough or working well enough to achieve some of the aspirations that we're seeing emerge in some of our recovery strategies and in some of our um, sort of national strategies to grow the cooperative economy. So we're going to spend a bit of time um, this, this morning, yeah, oh, this afternoon, sorry, uh, talking about uh, what architecture and infrastructure there exists within U the UK and how local government, specifically cooperative councils, can engage with those. Um, in the, one of the previous sessions, um, Joe White from Co-op Futures talked about the network of co-op development bodies um, and how local government and cooperative councils should be looking to develop relationships with, with those experts to support local co-op development. And that when there is local capacity, um, you, there's, there's evidence to suggest that you'll see a, a growth within the number of co-ops in that particular area. But I also think it's important to acknowledge that that is a declining uh, provider base. Um, it, it, it lacks uh, both volume to deliver um, significant uh, levels of business support. It's an aging network um, and it's not a particularly diverse network. And so if we are thinking about growing the crops of economies for the future, I think that we need to think uh, beyond that vitally important network of co-op development bodies and think about how do we utilize uh, collaboratively utilize um, existing infrastructure and I think that cooperative councils have a genuine offer and position to think about their resources in that way. Cooperatives UK in the absence of a national co-op development agency um, in particular in, in, in England um, has developed a program or, or a portfolio sorry of funded work that looks to support and encourage different forms of cooperative development across the UK. Um, all of this work is done in partnership and I'm going to hand over in a minute to a couple of my colleagues to talk about two really important areas of that work to give you some examples of the programmes that we're delivering um, and as well as an opportunity to ask any questions about how as co of councils you might engage with those programmes. Um, so I'm going, I, I also apologise if there's any noises in the background, there's a the building site opposite me and it's very noisy today. Um, so, and if you can move to the next slide. So, uh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Um, my name is James and I'm, I head up Coptus UK's development unit. I've been with Coptus UK for a number of years now um, and really enjoy uh, exploring opportunities for new partnerships. And I think the Coptus Council's Innovation Network has proven to be an incredibly important uh, growing part of our, of our relationships um, and particularly around the sort of Coptus development and Coptus growth agenda. Um, and with me today is Alice Walton, who's our Senior Programme Manager and who looks after all of our cooperative catapult programmes, and Jess Thomas, another Senior Programme Manager, who looks all after all of our programmes uh, that work in specific places or locations. So from here, I'm going to hand over to Alice. Uh, and Annie, if you take the next slide, that would be great. Over to you, Alice. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, my name's Alice Walton, and um, 
I'm very um, pleased to share with you uh, Community Shares. I hope that you've all heard of it, but if you haven't, then Community Shares are a fantastic way of bringing capital into businesses. They can be cooperative businesses or even they could be community owned co-op businesses. Um, so um, it provides patient capital for businesses to grow, become sustainable. Um, and it provides this risk capital for businesses to really um, develop in a more sustainable way that they couldn't do necessarily with just um, loans um, and grants. It helps communities to get away from grant dependency. But what more than that is that it, it offers a truly democratic structure where each member um, has one vote, regardless of the level of investment that they put into the business. So the, everyone is um, focused on the success of the business. It prevents aggressive takeovers. There's no um, wheeling and dealing. And it's, it's really important for the investors to be concentrating on the long term development of the community business rather than the short term individual benefit. You know, this is an investment community shares. It's not a donation. So the idea is that investors who commit to these community businesses um, can be paid capital, uh, paid back their capital after uh, an amount of time, after which the, the businesses start to become profitable. And also they can be paid uh, interest on the share capital so that they can, um, the communities themselves can attract the investors. To, to become involved in them. Um, and if you want to just move across to the next slide. So there's loads of guidance on community shares. Um, there's the community shares website, there's loads of guides and handbooks if you really want to get into it. But essentially it's a way for the community to co-own businesses in their local areas. It can be used very popularly, it's been used for pubs and shops, it can be used for libraries and swimming pools, broadband community hubs and working spaces and um, it's a way for the communities to build the businesses that they want to have in their communities. A really big part of it has been communities co-owning the energy um, installations, the re renewable en energies, so solar, hydro, wind, especially up in Scotland and Wales. Um, and there's a huge value to community shares um, as giving a, a business a competitive advantage. So um, the fact is that if it's co com community owned, then the survival rate is 92% in the first five years. Compare that to, to privately owned businesses or even other types of co-op businesses. It's huge, huge number and it really needs to be understood as a huge potential for loads of businesses um, to use the community to get behind them, to become part of the business. Um, and you know, there's loads of other ways it can be used, Sport, sports facilities, domiciliary care, which is very um, pressing concern in our ageing communities um, and all sorts of other types of things. So it's really up to the, the people in the place themselves to work out what it is that they need and what it will be a, a good trade and business for them to develop. So on the next slide. So this is just an idea of where we are with um, Cooperatives UK. We have a community shares unit and we started that way back in 2012. We have a government funded pilot. And what's an important thing is that we are very involved in maintaining and developing high standards in this um, arena. So community shares are um, uh, an unregulated financial product. So that means that the investor isn't protected. Um, by um, a recourse to the financial ombudsman. And so with that in mind, we have developed the standard mark, which is um, a nationally recognized kite mark, um, which you can see there in the center of the slide. Um, and this is something that if you are looking at a community shares offer, you should look for this because it means that it's been assessed by a third party, it's transparent, and um, it should be clear about what it is that the investor's been invited to invest into. Um, we also have the booster program, which I'll talk about in a, in a second. We have um, a committee which oversees all the standards work that we do. Um, and just to say that this was all developed with um, the financial, uh, the FCA and the uh, DCMS and all sorts of different uh, government departments as well. 
Um, and so now we're at the point where we have um, a whole, whole plethora of data and we can now better understand the community shares market as being rather mature and we have more established businesses which are demonstrating that you can make this work, that investors do get interest on their capital that they've invested and they do actually get to withdraw their capital as well so that they have the choice whether to reinvest that or put it into a new community shares offer or community shares business. Um, and so that will be coming out at the end of this month as well. The next slide about um, if you just go on one more slide. Yeah, this is just about some of the stuff that we do. So we do some of the market development work to help groups understand if community shares are right for them. We do the standards work. We offer development grants. We do do equity investments ourselves into these community share offers. And like I said, the research as well will be coming out soon and it continues that we collect data and we're the only body in the UK that does collect that sort of data as well. So, um, yeah, community shares have been used vastly across the UK. If you just carry on the next slide, please. Um, and uh, what's really great is that now we have this community shares booster program, which um, I manage at Cooptives UK. Um, we have a number of different partners. The funding partners are currently Power to Change and Architectural Heritage Fund. And what's fantastic is that through this, we um, not only offer development grants, but also equity. And we invest alongside the community. So we have the exact same terms as the rest of the community um, investors. And what's brilliant as well is the cyclical nature of equity. So it's not like a donation or a grant where you just you distribute it and then it's gone. We're really committed to being active investors into the societies that we would uh, invest. And we offer additional support and handholding. So it's not just at the point of investment that we're interested in. Uh, in supporting them, but also throughout their, their life cycle. Um, and we are focused very much on locally rooted community businesses and those that are involved with high street revival as well. So, yeah, we've invested over 2 million into 31 societies. We've got lots more in the pipeline. We've got more years of this to come. And what's great is that our um, investment is being demonstrated to leverage in more than double from the community investors. Um, and then on the next slide, you can see that we invest in all sorts of community shares um, businesses. So in terms of trade, we uh, trade sector, there's a lot of community hubs we've invested in, shops um, and energy and sports and leisure, health and social care, food, all sorts. And um, so there's a huge potential of um, how community shares can be used to make businesses come alive. So if we go on to the next slide, please, and then again. So a couple of our investments um, you might be interested in to um, we did some more is about equal care co-op. So this is a domiciliary care style co-op, but also using platform technology. Um, it's based in uh, the northwest around Hebden Bridge area, but there's huge potential for replication across the UK and beyond. Um, the next one is Stretford Public Hall, which is um, in uh, Manchester. It's an amazing community hub, um, really vibrant, so many people involved with it, so many volunteers, so many businesses, and we've invested 100,000 in that, and that had 776 investors from the community, so you can see the scale of um, community engagement there. And then Grimsby Community Energy is a real, um, really great uh, business. They've um, been putting solar panels on uh, business hubs and schools and all sorts. Um, and what's great about their model is that it's not just about the solar panels, but it's about how that they use the profits as well in education. Um, and the way that they've um, dealt with the reduction of the feed-in tariffs. So instead of just being responsible in the on the FITS, um, their business plans have developed so that their projects are now in collaboration with other neighbouring neighbor businesses. And those businesses use their, the site that Grimsby Community Energy generates on site or nearby. They have power purchase agreements. So it means that the neighbourhood businesses that are using the Grimsby Community Energy um, have to pay less in energy overall. 
And we found that the Booster Programme has proved an extremely popular and agile investment vehicle. We've been approached by so many more um, groups that we're actually able to support at the moment, um, just because um, there's just so much um, interest in the use of community shares. Um, but another thing to mention is that it's a research programme, so we're really focused on the most innovative approaches to community shares and we co-create some of these approaches with the groups so that they can recognise the best way to be able to engage as many people in their communities to be able to invest and to make the minimum share um, investment per individual as low as possible and to really um, bring in that idea of locally um, local power and, and, and empowerment. Um, so there's quite a few opportunities for councils and uh, local authorities to get involved with community shares. So if we go to the next slide, um, I mean, obviously, there's the chance to become part of the booster program um, and take advantage of this established and results driven local economic tool for development. Um, and to, in that respect, uh, local councils or um, whatever funding partner it is, um, they obviously have their own criteria and in a similar way to how we um, work with Architectural Heritage Fund, with Heritage or in specific geographies with other local authorities, we can um, design our support um, to, to match that of the funders' needs and to make sure that the, the groups on the ground are getting as much um, support as possible and to successfully develop and launch and, and run a community shares funded community business. Um, and then there's other ways as well. So um, if you go on the slides, we'll see that, and again, there's a few particular ways that um, councils or anyone really can, can become involved, even if you can't invest directly. There's lots of other ways to use our privileges and um, to really support these places. Um, it tends to be some really amazing people involved who are really driven, and really socially motivated. But at the end of the day, they really want to develop um, viable, sustainable and really um, useful businesses that will be used by the communities so in that respect there's all sorts of ways to help those individuals out and those groups possibly with planning support uh, possibly with volunteering staff resources to support the more nascent um, groups uh, grants to help them to um, with the early stages of developing the uh, ideas and also thinking about how we use established routes like business growth hubs to focus on more scaled interventions to support these community owned businesses. So in particular, there's other ways like asset transfers. Um, so this is an example um, where for Friends of Stretford Hall, that's the, the building in um, Manchester, which they bought off Trafford Council. And the one on the right is Woff Hall, which the group built off of um, Rotherham um, Metropolitan Borough Council. And these buildings have been resuscitated by the groups um, because they are now really actively involved in the community. They're a community anchor, they're used for classes, performance space, venue hire, film and TV sets. They've also been really integral to the food distribution and support hubs during the pandemic. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not only brought this space to the community, but it's also helping to protect the buildings themselves um, and giving them a new lease of life. Another way that um, these groups can be supported is with long leases. So if you're a freeholder of a property or a site to, to think about ways to support them, these two are um, Hume Community Garden Centre and Jubilee Pool Penzance. So we've established businesses to provide them with the security of really long leases so that they can confidently make these long-term investments using the community share capital that they've raised. Um, but with nascent businesses to think about renting them out on a really flexible basis or um, giving them turnover, rental contracts or very simple leases that are bolt on or expandable based on the, um, the natural development of the, the business over time. Um, and Jubilee Pool is an amazing one because it's, it's Art Deco Lido um, or Lido and it's um, the, 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 the community business operates the pool on a 99 year lease from the council and uh, it's been really 
important for being able to bring both tourists and locals together and making the investment minimum as low as possible. So it was £20, the very lowest minimum for people to get involved with that one. And they've put in geothermal so that they can use the pool all year round. And then uh, there's other ways, you know, think about the local procurement processes using these community businesses. So the next slide being uh, Projects Manchester, it's a skate park and uh, they run summer schools and after school clubs. Uh, the booster program invested £67,000 into that which was matched by the community and that was quite an impressive amount considering um, the, the level of deprivation in the area um, but the council were really involved in you know using their amazing skills the, the skaters there are so good and um, working with kids um, and then the last one is uh, community shares investing in actually yourself so uh, the Clipper Inn in Plymouth, it, it got um, investment from Plymouth City Council and it just shows that the transfa transformation that can be made. So this is the outside, it, it was an old pub um, and these are the two ladies who took it on um, and, and led the community business and the next slide shows you the before and after. It was just a bit of a wreck inside with a, a bar, pretty scratchy. And then now it's got an outdoor market in the backyard. It's got this lovely cafe upstairs. It's affordable housing in terms of flats. So they've really diversified the property. They brought it back to life. And now that is having this multiplier effect when they're taking on more properties and developing further using community shares again. Um, and so it just goes to show that you just need to get started and then um, so much more can happen when you have the community with you. Um, and if the, the councils or whoever the businesses are as well that invest, they invest alongside the community, it makes a massive difference. So, yep, yeah, that's, uh, that's about community shares. And what we're looking for now is to de demonstrate how we can expand this, how we can make it geographically um, situated in terms of the advice and the, the support, the equity that we make. Um, available to groups and we're really interested to work in collaboration with different local authorities to further fund the, the booster program so that we can get those funds out to the communities and um, yeah just uh, make it all make the magic happen. Thank you Alice, huge amounts of content to get through you know you've been you and we've been developing the community shares market for the last 10 years um, and you know it's a a perfect mechanism for both the local communities to, to to take control of some of their local economies but also an opportunity you know through the systems and the, the programs that we've built for corporate councils to get involved. I was going to suggest we move on so that Jess can talk about her work um, and then we can come to you know if there are any questions um, or if there's any resources that we can share to add a bit more detail. So over to you, Jess. Thanks, James. Um, so I'm going to spend um, a few minutes talking about our place-based co-op development, which is one of our work streams within um, the cooperative development unit. Um, Alice has just talked about um, community shares, <clears throat> excuse me, as an economic intervention. The reason we have place-based, um, a place-based work stream is that um, we believe that we can work in a place anchored way, which allows us to consolidate and work with um, multiple actors, multiple stakeholders, communities, local authorities at the same time to create solutions for places that um, work with those actors. So um, in, I'm gonna cover a few of the bits and pieces and ways that we've worked in different places uh, in a moment, but this is a sort of timeline, the journey that we've been on um, within Co-ops UK and um, how the landscape has changed and continues to change and has, has sped up in terms of place-based working. Um, so we started with this uh, program on the AOC CED program, which stands for Community Economic Development. Um, that was a, a government funded program, uh, uh, MCHLG um, funded program back in 2017. Um, and this program worked with a number of partners, including locality, where we sought to work with place anchored um, uh, partnerships um, to produce community economic development plans with a set of uh, economic interventions for their places that worked um, for the communities. That program was two years long. Um, we ended up working with 70 places 
um, over that period and producing community economic development plans uh, for each of those places which took on a, sit, a, a whole array of interventions um, and we sort of placed community economic development there as being one of the foundations for the ability to undertake co-op development which I'll go into a little bit more as we move through the timeline our second sort of flagship piece of work here um, is a program called Empowering Places, which is a power to change funded place based program. Um, and I'll again go through this in brief because there could be a whole other conversation about um, the scope of this program, but it's, it's a five year long program that takes a place based approach to the development of community owned um, enterprise in places. It focused specifically on six locations, so hyperlocal locations, um, in the lowest 10% of the IMDs, so places that are experiencing multiple uh, points of deprivation, and seeing um, what forms of intervention you can take to support the growth of community-owned enterprise in those places that are thriving, surviving, and meet the needs of those places. Um, the interesting element of this particular programme um, in terms of this journey is that uh, the investment is taking place through a number of community anchor organisations, so places with physical assets, community development organisations in these hyper-local places that, as I mentioned, experience a lot of um, complex levels of deprivation. And the investment goes into those places to lift up those community anchor organisations as economic actors and uh, as the um, point of intervention to catalyse these businesses. Um, and through this has developed our sort of relational approach to place based working. Um, I've got a, a small case study that we'll talk about um, on the next slide. But we are using community economic development um, as the sort of um, framework in how we undertake those interventions in those places. So as I said, that program's ongoing. Um, we then uh, in 2018, I believe, um, formed a partnership with the Employee Ownership Association and have uh, launched our 1 million owners campaign, um, an ambitious sort of campaign within the partnership to see a five-fold increase in work employee owned business um, in uh, the next decade, so 2030, which would result in 1 million owners. Um, this campaign is really sort of profiling the opportunity and the coalescence between worker co-op, um, worker conversion and employee owned business and understanding that there's, there's, a whole, um, there's a lot of opportunity for this development of kind, this kind of business um, in the UK and that there's a series of actions um, that we need to undertake, um, which I'll go on to when we come to our ownership hub programme. That, that campaign is ongoing. Uh, again, we'll send out some resources. Um, and then as we get into um, the bizarre year that is 2020, um, we published our We Are The Rebuilders um, policy position, which really looks to four cooperative offers for our times, but that are also place-based. Um, through this, we're calling out to place-based institutions, primarily um, local combined authority levels, to work with us on and how we can um, make the most of the opportunities currently presented for um, co-ops to step into places um, where they could have um, positive benefit for things like the Build Back Better agenda. Um, and so within this, we, we, we say that the opportunities are for the uh, retention of viable jobs locally, um, particularly through worker and employee owned business, uh, for the creation of new jobs, um, decent jobs, which would be through sort of the opportunity for worker co-ops to start up. Um, the opportunity for to breathe new life into community assets. So, you know, that really speaks to um, the way Alice was just speaking of what's going to happen to these buildings as they become vacant. How can we revive high streets? Uh, what does it mean for people to have places to meet um, and the, opportunity, the opportunities that are presented there and also the final opportunity under the We Are The Rebuilders to harness um, the community energy which has we've seen so fervently on display um, through COVID and continues um, particularly there you know we talk about the opportunities for um, the green agenda to really thrive within um, sort of co-op opportunities co-op development. Um, Building on that, we have submitted um, to uh, our submission for the comprehensive spending review. 
um, which we're saying now is an opportunity for the government and local government to really invest um, in this space for worker and employee owned business. We've made um, a call to the government to invest 10 million pounds um, to in, uh, expand our um, ownership hub model to see the growth and in support of our 1 million owners campaign. Um, and that sort of brings me to our, um, our ownership hub project, which is our new flagship project fledgling at the moment, um, uh, seeking to sort of launch fully uh, in 2021. Within this, we are developing a model of interventions and uh, co-production um, where we develop a hub and then a spoke um, of that hub, which will become our ownership hub demonstration project. We want to work with a, a combined authority or LEP level area to um, work in collaboration with them on a number of interventions um, to see the growth of that business. And I've got um, a slide with a little bit more information on that. So I'll go on to that in a moment. And if you could just slip on to the next slide. Fab, thank you. Um, so we have already undertaken uh, a number of pieces of work um, and we're seeing this interest increase in this time um, where local authorities, combined authorities, other place level actors, community organisations are looking to solutions that last in the long term. As Alice mentioned, we see a 92% um, survival rate of um, community co-ops um, and that's something that people are very interested in at the moment. Four quick uh, case studies just to run through. Um, the first being Grimsby, uh, which is the example from our Empowering Places program. We've worked with um, Centre 4 there, which is based on um, an estate called Nunsthorpe. And uh, through that piece of work there, the Catalyst organisation have really, um, because of our sort of longitudinal piece of work and the, the focus on building their capacity to make economic interventions, that uh, Centre 4 we've really seen grow from being a community service led organisation to an organisation that is proactively seeking the support of community enterprise um, that, that meets the local need. And a couple of examples I just really wanted to draw on there is they've developed a community business um, which is called ERA, the Ethical Recruitment Agency, um, which works on, on two levels in the respect that it works with employers in the region to replace um, less vicious forms of um, recruitment. So to make sure that there's good opportunities and good recruitment process for local employers, whilst also building up the capacity and opportunity for um, individuals to gain employability through training, volunteering. Um, and that's sort of uh, been a really interesting form of intervention that, that thinks about um, the broad economic policies of a place. Uh, another thing, I mean, I could talk about this for a while, but I'm gonna try and keep it brief, but um, another piece of work that they have done there is that um, they are beginning to um, be more involved on a um, strategic level, institutional level in their place. Um, and what we've really seen here is a flip to understanding Centre for as a community anchor organisation as an economic actor, as being a good site through which we can work with them on both co-op development, community enterprise development, um, and the development of uh, co-op culture um, and our idea of cooperative places. Um, by that organisation being recognised as a proactive economic actor um, capable of working alongside other forms of um, institutions. So as I said, I'll move on from that briefly, plenty more that I could share. Another piece of work that we're undertaking at the moment is working with um, Preston City Council. So I, I believe some of that will have been discussed already today. Um, we are working with them as strategic advisors on their capacity building. We're part of a steering group looking at a series of interventions again on co-op development in place um, and there we are supporting another piece of work through the Preston Cooperative Development Agency in seeking to uh, support 10 new worker co-ops um, to be established in Preston. Uh, we are undertaking alongside Preston City Council a number of um, awareness raising pieces of work which is both public and outward facing so webinars um, as what we're calling sort of launch pad um, events to try and build up a bit of basic knowledge of introduction of cooperative models but also working um, alongside internal um, uh, teams at the council so working with the community engagement team 
on how they understand co-ops so they can start translating some of that basic knowledge um, to ways of working and start signposting more effectively. Um, there's also a piece of work uh, in collaboration with Stir to Action, working specifically with um, uh, black minority ethnic and migrant communities on the role of cooperativism um, and that support for forming new cooperative business within those communities. Again, more we could talk about, but I sort of wanted to highlight it in the multi-layered approach that we're taking there. So the City Council, I think again, James mentioned uh, that this has been referenced already today, but we worked with them uh, to uh, develop a um, cooperative development strategy, which has been fully adopted, which seeks to double uh, the size of the cooperative economy in Plymouth. Again, that takes sort of um, some of the lessons from those two first examples about the multi-layered approach, the different forms of interventions working from community right through to having um, a large scale investment um, available for new cooperative business and Alice also mentioned Nudge as a good example there in Plymouth. And then finally we've also worked um, in Lincolnshire with the um, Lincolnshire Cooperative Development Agency on producing um, a strategy there which again looks at the network effect um, that can be developed across place. Lincolnshire is interesting, it's uh, one of our cold spots but um, establishing strategies for linking up um, all of the different actors involving community through to different um, investment strategies that would need to be undertaken. So very, very whistle-stop tour, um, a, a brief snapshot of the different ways that we're working with places and the different practice that we're developing around um, forms of intervention that we're taking. And if you just pop on the next slide, thanks. Um, and then, so yeah, as I've sort of mentioned, our, our a large piece of our program that's helped us really consolidate our cooperative development offer on a place level is the ownership hub project. Um, we've got a number of offers within this that sort of form the concept of the ownership hub. So the provision of data and intelligence, better understanding what the opportunities are in place alongside understanding fully what's already happening. So where are the um, family businesses that may be, you know, where the owners may be going into retirement that are right for um, employee buyouts, perhaps. Where are the good opportunities for community uh, co-ops to start? Where are the assets in place? So fully understanding place and opportunity and building that capacity um, alongside local authority or let level. CPD training um, is another element that we've built into this program as we understand is a, a deficit that we believe in um, sort of is a barrier to seeing more co-ops develop on a place level. So this ranges right through from, as I mentioned in Preston, something like working with a community engagement team through to practitioners, whether it's economic development, workers, enterprise, coaches, um, accountants, uh, and other, um, other people on uh, building up and mainstreaming the co-op option. Um, development grants, a very important thing, again, I don't need to sort of go over that, but the, the, the injection of initial cash and support for those businesses that are at the stage that they believe they want to go through the process of either a uh, worker employee buyout or setting up new worker co-ops um, and undertaking intensive pieces of work, um, multiple weeks or months supporting them through that various transition process. Awareness raising um, in, in, in its many forms and then an online portal, which was sort of our hub of consolidating and simplifying a lot of the information that we really hold between ourselves and the Employee Ownership Association to make it as accessible as possible and link to that place as much as possible. So as I said, um, we will announce the uh, location that we're planning on working with bef um, before the end of the year. Um, and we'll work intensively with them and to co-produce a lot of this, but it will be based on these principles. We uh, are hoping to find funding to work with more places um, at least two within the next year. Uh, as we said in the um, uh, comprehensive spending review, we've asked for 10 million pounds from the government. Let's all cross our fingers that that will um, appear. And then we hope to work with up to 20. So the model here is that we've developed the hub and spoken the basic principles. And we would like to invite as many places that are interested in taking this on to see the growth of employee and worker ownership in their places to uh, be in contact with us. Um, yeah, so I think the next slide is just the opportunities for uh, cooperative councils. I just want to say uh, sort of three things before I pass back to James, um, that hopefully it's come through in that brief introduction of the 
ways that we're working with places is that um, there are multiple forms of intervention that we are supporting on. Um, and what's exciting about the place-based working is we are taking some basic core principles, but working really collaborative, collaboratively with places and finding solutions alongside those places on the basis of what they need. And these range, um, I've loosely put them into sort of three categories of working at that community grassroots level. So producing the knowledge, expertise, skills, building the social capital um, of places and the people that live there. Uh, to support the growth of co-ops, um, working on the sort of institutional level, so whether that's the CPD training internally for local authorities, um, mainstreaming it across the whole um, organisation, across all departments within local authorities or other anchor institutions, uh, traditional ones as we'd understand it, um, including sort of community wealth building. And then the final one is these sort of um, innovative uh, interventions which I think brings back to Alice's point of the roles that um, the important interventionist role that local authorities combined authorities and other anchor institutions can play in developing new models and we are particularly in a time where there is opportunity for innovation so those are the sort of three areas that I would say we're kind of working at the moment but really happy to hear from others about other opportunities that are there thanks Thank you, Jess, um, and thank you, Alice, and thank you for the for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, what we've tried to convey there is that it's a welcome uh, change to see cooperative councils and local councils wanting to engage uh, with us on at an, uh, an economic agenda. And there's existing infrastructure and projects that we can utilise or work with you uh, to amplify or in your place. Um, and so I think we, we're going to leave it there in terms of sort of presenting and open it up to any questions. Um, but uh, with so few of us in the room, and uh, I'm not quite sure if we're going to have a conversation now, I've seen Nicola has joined us, um, but there is a huge amount of resources, um, learning, knowledge that we've developed in partnership with our memberships and wider part, uh, stakeholders over time that could really inform how we might work in partnership and take some of these things forward. Um, so I shall leave it there. Um, I can only see my colleagues' faces uh, and Nicola, um, but unless anyone has any burning questions, um, there, you know, please do feel free to get in touch with Cooperatives UK uh, regarding this area of our work and how we might work together. Uh, and also note that we are on the dynamic purchasing system and so there is a mechanism there um, to engage directly with you.